Here's where we enter into the story as to the last plague that was going to take place. Because this is when the, the Passover was instituted. So understand, if you believe Jesus to be our Passover, what's the significance of Passover in the Old Testament? Because G Jesus becomes our Passover. Hi, my name's Angel Falcon and I'm honored to be uh, before you here today. We believe that there's no greater responsibility entrusted to us as believers uh, to give you, teach you the Word of God. I trust that you will be richly blessed by what you're about to hear. Remember that as we increase in the knowledge of God's Word, His blessings are sure to fall upon us. Trust you will be blessed. Several things I want to call your attention to concerning Jesus. When John the Baptist behold Jesus coming near to him, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Oftentimes he says, Behold the Lamb. In Isaiah, the prophet foretold that this lamb was going to come and take away the sins of the world. He was led to the slaughter on our behalf. Are you with me? In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, the Bible tells us that for indeed Christ, right, is our Passover who was sacrificed for us. So Jesus is a lamb. And it's a beautiful comparison to something that has taken place. He's called the Passover lamb. There's all kinds of scriptures. Uh, actually, I think there's over, over 20 scripture verses just in Revelation alone that calls Jesus the lamb, the lamb of God that that redeemed us, that reconciled us, right? That purchased us. Last week we, 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 we dealt with uh, that everything was imputed to Jesus' account. So all that we should have got was imputed into his life. That's what, that's what the cross represents. He died on behalf of you and I. But it's interesting how they call him the Passover lamb. And if you don't, if you don't understand the history of the Passover, we, we would lose sight of a, a valuable truth. Jesus himself, and we're going to look at some scriptures later on, but Jesus himself celebrated the Passover feast. They did all of the preparations for it. And then a couple of interesting things that happened in the Old Testament we see being relived in the New Testament that I think is valuable, invaluable for us to understand the significance of this Lamb of God. That takes away the sins of the world. And being that we're celebrating his death, burial, and resurrection, we ain't, you know, listen, we, we know love led him to lay down his life. No one could take it from him, right? So, so but rising from the dead is the crowning victory of Jesus' plan for us. Because it tells us that what he did for himself, what he was able to do for himself, right? He can do for us. So I want you to understand 
well, how does how did this all start? What what was he celebrating? What was this Passover feast? What was this? Well, the story leads us to Exodus. See, God's people. God had called Abram out of a nation, and God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit reached out to Abram and really wanted to reach God's purpose in reaching to Abram and calling him out, right, is significant because God's plan was to bring restoration to what was broken. Man was alienated from God, separated because of sin, so God had to somehow find a way to reconcile humanity back to himself. And so all of the story, is, it, this is all significant, but God's people, sometimes, how many of you know you, you can love God and sometimes you can just do so wrong? You can go, you can be so off the mark. And so they, they kind of rebelled. There were times where they did good and times that they did bad. And they got to a place where they were so uh, rebellious that the hand of God, the blessings of God was lifted from them. And it was even foretold. It says, because of your rebellion, you, you'll, be, you'll be enslaved by your surrounding enemies. I'm not going to protect you. I ain't going to forget you, but I ain't going to protect you. It's kind of what we do when our kids do wrong, you know, even though they want their favorite sneaker, they're not, they're going to get, you know, downgraded <laughs> to peer flyers. So, some of y'all don't even know what that, how many of you know what that, peer flyers? We still got a crowd, the over 50 crowd. <laughs> so, but, you know, so God, God always honored obedience and even when they were rebellious God was dealing with them but when they continued in their rebellion God had to deal with them so what happened was it, their land started you know the God's hand wasn't upon them and they were they were kind of scattered and then all of a sudden um, we all remember the story of Joseph remember when he was in Egypt sold as a slave um, wrongly accused right uh, by Pontifus in Egypt, but God used him to be a help to the nation of Israel. So there, there's, a, there's a line here, right? So because of Israel's rebellion, listen carefully, they, they, they were, there was a famine in the land and they were desperate for food and they heard that Egypt had food. When they went to Egypt for food, you know, Joseph, who they had sold, right, um, was there and God had positioned him there through great pain and challenges, but he was in a position where he can help them. So Pharaoh found favor with them, and so they were got comfortable. And the Bible teaches us that they stayed there too long, to the point where then another Pharaoh came up, it wasn't feeling them, and then they became slaves because they stayed somewhere where they were not supposed to stay at. So this is the story. Are you following me? So finally, God even reveals, all right, God revealed to Abraham way before Moses, right, that because of their rebellion that they were going to be enslaved some 400 years. And to the letter, God fulfilled that. Finally, when it was time to deliver them, we all know the story, he sends Moses. Divinely approaches Moses. Uh, he was hesitant not to get involved, but, you know, he did have a passion for his people, and he obeyed. So the story begins, Moses goes to Pharaoh, and he says, God sent me to let my people go. And Pharaoh said, hey, hey, hey. understand, he was the man in that time. There was none higher. The, the, he, he possessed everything around him, every nation. He was the strongest, most powerful nation in existence. There was none like him. So he was very arrogant. Be careful. 
Because you can be arrogant and still have nothing, but think you do, or think you're somebody. Uh-oh, let me just keep it moving. So, so here, the story begins. Moses goes there, and he says, you need to let my people go. And who are you? Who's your God? You know? Get out of here. And so God led Moses, and then the plagues came. You remember the plagues? There was all kinds of things. So, all right, he's, so we're going to, you're not going to do it the nice way, so now you're going to have to do it the hard way, right? God divinely intervenes and sends plagues. The first thing that happens is they used to love their river Nile. They used to worship it. What an amazing place. So God turns the Nile into blood, right? The second thing he does, he's, he sends frogs. And finally, he said, let my people go or you're going to be cursed with frogs. And, and, and um, frogs came and, and, and Pharaoh sent for Moses and, um, okay, uh, let's fix this. Let's try, you know, I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing this, you know, and, and then he says, so you want me to, you know, but we'll wait till tomorrow to decide. So he wanted to sleep one more day with the frogs. <laughs> That didn't make sense to me, but that's the story. Then lace came, uh, lice came. Then flies came. And, the, and it's interesting how, uh, you see, the Egyptian people at that time, they worshipped everything. Everything was, they worshipped, they made a god of everything. Actually, the, you know, the, it was, a, a frogs were to them worship as a symbol of fruitfulness, because they would kind of multiply a lot. So, um, the, the flies also, you know, again, it, they used to worship that as well. Uh, the livestock they worshipped, and they had animal worship as well. Um, and then, the, you know, again, one of the other plagues were boils and locusts and darkness because they used to, the sun was a god to them, you know. And then, um, finally, you know, even they used to worship the sun. And so God sends one of the plagues is darkness for a long time. Just to try to figure, you know, yo, I'm God, let my people go. You know? So here's where we enter into the story as to the last plague that was going to take place. Because this is when the, the Passover was instituted. So understand, if you believe Jesus to be our Passover, what's the significance of Passover in the Old Testament? Because G Jesus becomes our Passover. Amen? So I want you to turn with me to Exodus chapter 11. I want to begin reading at 11, and it's just so that we can jump in in the middle of this story. If you need a Bible, we have some extra one. Um, but if you, if you don't have, if you don't own a Bible, I'm sure that there's an under, there's an app for you to download. <clears throat> so in, in Exodus chapter 11, I want to read several scripture verses. I might jump from a few because I don't, you know, I, I want to stay focused on, on what I'm trying to impart to you here uh, this morning. Exodus chapter 11, verse 1. And the Lord said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. And afterward, he will let you go from here. And when he lets you go, he will surely drive you out of here altogether. Speak now, verse 2, in the hearing of the people. In other words, now Moses, I want you to tell the people. And let every man ask his neighbor and every woman from, uh, from her neighbor articles of silver and articles of gold. Isn't that interesting? God is telling them, you know, ask all your neighbors. Now, they were living intertwined. They were living away from Egyptian people, but some of them live close to Egyptians. Some of them work with them, right? Some of them were taskmasters to them. So understand the scenario. Now, so God says, ask them for silver and gold. Now, you, what audacity... What right? Let me, just, let me just meddle in this thing just for a little bit. You know how, and the Bible says that they found favor and they gave it to them. 
Well, let me tell you why they gave it to them. They gave it to them because they just went through a bunch of plagues that tormented them. Yeah, you need to go. Here's some money. Get, here's some silver, some earring. Check my chain. Go. <laughs> Glad to see you go. Maybe some of these plagues will, will end and enough, right? So verse 3 says, And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt. Why was he great? Because he was a man of God, and he confronted, he had no army, but he confronted Pharaoh to release, and the uh, theologians believe, over some 3 million Hebrews. 3 million men, that's not including, and you know, women always outnumber men <laughs> and children, right? So look at the scenario. So he was respected. He was a great man in the sight of Pharaoh's servant and in the sight of the people. And Moses said, thus says the Lord, about midnight, I will go out into the midst of Egypt and I will, and all the firstborn, verse 5, in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sits in his throne, even to the firstborn of the female servant, who is behind the hand mill, and all of the firstborn of the animal. One thing is if the firstborn male, I mean, but when you're talking about, you know this is judgment, because it's taking everybody, right? It's affecting everybody. A specific group of people. But against none of the children of Israel shall a dog move the tongue against man or beast that you may know that the Lord does make a difference. He does make a distinction between the Egyptians who are godless, right, and Israel who was a rebellious, but at least they were somehow pursuing God. The Bible says that God finally had heard their cry, left them there, finally heard their cry, and decided to move. So now, in, in, in chapter 12, it gives us, it, uh, the, this statement has just been said and decreed that the firstborn of everything is going to die, Okay, so now God gives instructions to Moses as to what he had to do. And so it, he speaks to the congregation and he tells them, he gives them great detail as to what to prepare. He says, you all got to get a lamb or a goat. It has to be without spot, without blemish of any kind. And all of this was symbolic. Isn't it interesting? They needed a lamb. They sacrificed it. He gave strict instructions on how to cook it, how to prepare it, and what to do with it. And also, it told them that if there's anything left over, burn it before day, you know, before morning. So there were specific things that he shared. And after they had prepared all that, right, he gives instruction in, in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 7 that I want to read. It says, and they shall take some of the blood of the lamb that they just slain and put it on the two doorposts and on the lentil of the houses. Okay, that was the instruction. Then it gave him instruction on how to cook it, what to do, what not to do. You know, and in verse, let's skip down to verse 12. Now we're going to get into some nitty gritty that I want to focus on here today. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all of the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Verse 13 says, and now the blood shall be a sign. Say a sign. For you in the houses when, where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over 
you. So judgment came. God sent an angel. They call him the angel of death. Goes to show you some angels are no joke. You know, sometimes we have them real, you know, dainty looking, but they're man of war as well. God's got them. And so the, the, the situation is now, this is why, do you know why they call it the Passover feast? Because it's, it signifies right here, it was instituted that because now that you're in covenant with God, you're in obedience to what he said, right? You sacrifice the lamb, you put blood on the doorpost and on the lentil, that means the top of the door, so you get it? <laughs> Father, Son, Holy Ghost, huh? That he, when he sees the blood, he will pass over and not bring judgment to that house. Amen. Amen. Thank you, and that's exactly what happened over there. The interesting thing now, I want to take you to uh, Matthews. Because here we find that Jesus himself himself institutes or celebrates the Passover. And it is not by coincidence that Jesus came to die exactly when they're celebrating the Passover feast. Jesus tells us in, 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 um, in Matthew 26, beginning at verse 20 in 17, it says, and now on the first day of the, of the feast of the unleavened bread, you know, which was united also with the Passover feast, the disciples came to Jesus saying to him, where do you want us to, uh, to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And then get, Jesus gave him some instruction and sure enough, you know, they, they did preparation. But then in verse 26, right, after he's having this Passover feast, the Last Supper was Passover feast. And then he begins to share, Jesus himself begins to share concerning at the Last Supper. And he says this in verse 26, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread. He blessed it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Interesting. In the Old Testament, it was a lamb, a physical lamb, right? That if you ate and you, you, you understood the significance of the blood on the doorpost and lentil, right? When, when the angel sees that, they know that you're in covenant with God and that judgment is not for you. Here now Jesus is saying, he saw the bread, he broke it, blessed it, and he says, take, eat, this is my body. See the correlation? This is my body which is broken for you, right? And then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood, my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for, the, for many for the remissions, the forgiveness of sin. That's why Christians, when we partake of communion, we declare the Passover lamb. When we acknowledge the, the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord, the Bible says the blood, we're sealed by the blood of Jesus. And because of that, we are redeemed from all kinds of stuff. As the Passover lamb, you know, we read in, in Hebrews, you don't need to turn there, but in Hebrews 9, 11, it says, not, you know, not with the blood of ghosts or calves, but with his own blood, he entered into the holies, the most holy place once and for all, having obtained redemption. 
For we understand that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So now, by the grace of God, we are redeemed. When we acknowledge, so now, so now, because of the Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb of God, now the Bible tells us that now you no longer belong, you're no longer of this world but heaven. The devil is no longer your Lord, Jesus is your Lord. Now you belong to God. We belong to Him. We are His beloved. We have been redeemed by the precious power of the blood of Jesus. And so now, we, when we stand in covenant and in agreement with God, the devil has to pass over you. But if you don't know your rights in Christ, he'll bully you push you around, try to rob, steal, and kill you before your time. Amen. But God says that if, I mean, demons know. Remember, demons, even demons recognize who Jesus was. Jesus was rebuking demons, and all of a sudden, a few people saw them, and they were religious exorcisms. You know, they, they like to exorcise. You know, they were in that that field and and they rebuke the demon he says we rebuke you in the name of of jesus whom paul preaches yeah. and the demon says i know jesus and i know paul but who are you you better know what you're doing Amen. so he's you know we are redeemed jesus is our passover lamb and because we belong to him, we, the Bible says we've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness, and now we belong to him. Blood bought, purchased, accepted, a beloved. Just the way you are. And he embraces you. And the Bible says that now you, you know, be, that's why the scripture says, you know, I love that scripture that says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You need to declare, I'm redeemed. Am I perfect? No, I'm trying to do the right thing, you know, and I'm, I'm working hard at making sure that I allow the spirit of God to work in me. Because you can say I love Jesus, but until, until, until you die to self, that's the process. So Jesus as our Passover lamb. So now the same thing that, that couldn't happen to God's people in Egypt. And, the, you know, when, when, when the spirit came and judgment came, judgment, you see, judgment is not for you. Judgment is no longer for you. Most of us get up, oh, well, you know, I know if I do wrong, God's going to, he's going to, he's going to drop the hammer. Sometimes, you know, listen, there, God is not mocked. Whatever, whatever a man sows in life, he will reap. But there is a grace period where God knows if you're really doing the right thing. There's a, you know, when you know your kids are doing the right thing, you, you're easy on them. But when you know they're outright they're rebellion, they know to do better and don't, judgment is more severe. At least it is in my house. This is who Jesus is. He redeemed you. He redeemed you, the Bible says, from the curse of the law so that the blessings of Abraham can rest upon you. The blessings of Abraham are amazing because God says, man, I will be with you, man. Whoever blesses you, I will bless. Whoever curses you, I will curse. I will, you know, and again, he made a promise that redemption was going to come through the lineage of Abraham. And sure enough, and out of that, a great and mighty people will come forth from that. You are Abraham's seed. We are Abraham's seed. I think we need to rise up to a place where we become really bold in saying, I am the redeemed of the Lord. I know I have my I have rights that are in God that God is working for me not against me. Amen. 
That he is leading me. Sometimes it's painful. Sometimes there's a struggle. But God will bring you through. That's his promise. You are mine. I love when he says, no, there's no power in heaven, on earth, or beneath the earth. All three realms of existence. There's no power that can separate you from the love of God. No one can pluck you out of my hands unless you willfully walk out. I, I want you to grab hold of that. I am redeemed. I'm God's property. Not perfect in the process, right? Looking to die to self, to walk in the spirit. One of the promises to, to Abraham was that when this time came, the promise was God's inhabited spirit in our spirit. And that's why he, the Bible says that that's why what God did in redemption is our guarantee. That's, that's the warranty that'll get you to heaven. If you submit to God, you're guaranteed. It's not if, it's not maybe. The Bible says it's because of what Jesus did, I'm guaranteed. But I got to be in Christ. Amen. I can't assume that if I'm, you know, let me just run my card. I got this credit card that lets me in. And you're not allowing the Spirit of God to do his part in you. See, that's the conflict. That's the problem that we, 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 we struggle in. We are redeemed. We are redeemed from the consequences of death. We are redeemed from the results. Uh, again, the consequences of real death is sin. Because you got to be careful of dying the second death. Don't be scared about dying physically. Be scared because they say that when, when you're separated from God, that's the second death. When, when, you're, you're, when you're told not to go up but down, that's the second death. So we've been redeemed. The Bible says we have been redeemed. Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law. The consequences of disobedience. When, the consequences of sin. God has redeemed us. I'm blessed to know that, you know, God, because of that, now the forces of darkness, once you know it, beloved, and hold on to it, and the Bible says, having done all, keep standing. Some people say, Pastor, I've been praying a long time. How long do I have to pray? Pray until you get victory, man. Pray till you break through, my God. Whoever, some of us, are, oh, do I pray like, two, is two days okay? <laughs> Come on. But I'm blessed. Blessed. And the Abrahamic blessings are mine as well. The uh, Moses' blessing is mine. The Bible says that, we, he's, that because of the Passover lamb, now I belong to him. And because of that, now I'm, I'm blood bought, blood redeemed, I'm purchased, I'm his beloved. The Bible says I am now adopted. I'm an adopted child. Amen. I belong to him. And he belongs to me. I abide in him and he abides in me. It's about redemption. I gotta make I gotta I gotta make me some nice hoodies and t-shirts and redeemed. I, and when I say that, I say it humbly because of what he did. This is not something I earned. Redemption is not something I earned. He purchased for us. Amen. Now you're his property. You're his beloved. And the devil will try and sift you and he'll try all that he can do. 
but God's called you, you just keep standing. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The all-sufficient one is in you. Trust me, the storms will gather and pass, and you who are redeemed will remain forever. Amen. Forever. It's an eternal blessings. We're just sojourning here in this world. The Bible says that we are redeemed. Declare this confession of faith with me. I am chosen, redeemed, blessed, adopted, forgiven, and accepted. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's no wonder he says, I have blessed you with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. There's nothing, nothing, nothing that he's not willing to give to you. Glory to God. I'm, I'm glad that somebody's excited out there. <laughs> Precious. Nothing. I know that sometimes, you know, the enemy comes and attacks us. and We don't understand why, but one thing we know. That whatever it is, God will always work it out for our good. It'll work out. Instead of worrying, instead of entering in unbelief, oh, what am I going to do? What do, you, what do you mean, what are you going to do? You're going to trust God, right? Amen. I just lost my job. What am I going to do? God will have to find you another one. Amen. He knows you got to eat. <laughs> if anything, he'll show you the, what house to go to. <laughs> I'm telling you, God can support you. God can support if he supported many a prophets of old. <laughs> I, look, you know, here's what, you, you guys laugh, you laugh at that statement, but listen to this. Man of God prays for famine. He prayed for the rain to stop because of the rebellion of the people. So he prays, so now there's no food. Livestock are dying, all vegetation are dying, right? Um, so now the prophet don't have no food. He goes to God and God says, I want, there's an old lady I want you to go to, go to her, and she's got something to give you. The interesting thing is that when he goes to the old lady, the old lady, all she has is a little bit of flour. This is all I got, and, and after I have this, I'm gonna, me and my kid are going to die. So here it is. God sends the prophet to a woman who barely has enough for herself. I got a problem with that, right? I wouldn't have gone there. I would have gone to someone, you know, who can help me. But too often God brings help from the least expected person. Good God Almighty. <laughs> Amen. Because God can, can take care of you. God can do it. God can do it. And we got to trust him. Value your redemption, beloved. Value the fact that you belong to him. Value the fact that God's promises are yes and amen. When God, God, listen to me very clearly here today. God will not promise anything to anyone that he can't deliver. Amen. If he said it, settle it in your heart and know that he is ever faithful. He's ever faithful. No matter whatever the circumstances, I know, amen, that the curse of the Lord has to pass over. Sickness and disease got to pass over. Amen. It tries to come on my body. But I resist it, I oppose it, and I declare the redemptive promises of our Lord. If you're unfruitful, believe God. Because, I mean, if he can get a 90-year-old woman to, have to get pregnant, I don't think you're a problem. <laughs> I'm talking to somebody. Oh, Jesus. Not 
Not going to say that. <laughs> but you got to look at the old guy, too, who was 100. She was 90. He was even older. And there was no pharmaceuticals back in those days. <laughs> Read between the lines up in there. God did it. Because God promised. Hold on to the promises of God. If you're going through a, a situation, whether it's financial, emotional, marital, you know, relational, whatever your situation, there's a promise, there's a word from the Lord for you. And understand that when you hold on to that, amen, you, when you stand on the word of God, the devil has no other option but to what? Pass over. Say that with me. Pass over. Not in this house. You got to pass over. Are there needs in your home? Yes. Trust God to meet them. Ask God if you need to be a better steward of what you have. Because often we get ourselves in a mess. Yes. But God is a God of provisions. God, you know, he says, see, when he blesses you, he bl when, when God blesses you, it, it don't... Blessings just come falling on your lap. Yes. I know this. I've seen this time and time again, beloved. I remember when I stood and everybody else was concerned about their job. And then God just kind of created. Created out of a job that wasn't even in existence. How did? And, and when you're working for the, for the, for the a state employee, as a state employee, difficult to do. Because you got to go up through the, the, the civil servant system. But God, God knew what he had to do. And it's about, you know, when, when, when you know that you know that you've been redeemed. When you walk in obedience, the favor of yes. God. Yes. He'll even cause your enemies to help you. Yes. That's right. That person that bad mouthed you. You'd be surprised. No, babe, the Lord spoke to me last night. And told me to give you this. And you're going to stay there. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. You don't think that that's happened? A door of opportunity all of a sudden. Wow. Less work, more pay. That works for me. Amen. You've been redeemed. God is concerned about every aspect of your life. Even your kid. Just because you serve God, God even watches your kids, 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 kids. Oh, but pastor, you don't know how rebellious they are. Just keep praying and keep watching. Because they're going to come. Yes. There, I, I, there are times I don't know what to pray. I said, all I know to say, I said, Lord, Holy Ghost, sick him, sick him. <laughs> Sometimes they got to go through their wilderness experience just like God's people did. They wanted to get delivered from Egypt. But there was such a knucklehead after he delivered them that they got into rebellion. And what could have what could have happened in less than a week, God had to keep them out there for 40 years. Don't you do that. God can redeem you from your setbacks. What could have been, should have been, but you know what? Didn't happen. You don't think God is able to pick up the pieces of your life and bring hope again to you? Come on. Sometimes we're so focused on us trying to manipulate things. Now, we're responsible for certain things. But beyond that, God's in control. And you got to know that. You are the redeemed. That scripture is found in Psalms 107 verse 2. It says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Have an attitude. I'm redeemed. Some people may think that to be arrogant. 
No, I'm just saying God's got me. I belong to him. He belongs to me. I'm in covenant with God. And I'm walking in his goodness. I'm embracing his promises. And I'm not looking to be blessed. Amen. I just know that if I pursue him, blessings will come. And when I'm blessed, I can be a blessing to others. Let me tell you, God is serious about that. If he feels that you're going to hoard up blessings, he's not going to, he refuses to pour blessing into something that doesn't, isn't able to disperse it. That's why he says it is more blessed to give. Why is it more blessed to give? Because the more you give, the more comes. Amen. Amen. You are redeemed. You're a child of God. Translated out of the key. I know some of you are saying, well, Pastor, I don't feel redeemed. Who said anything about you feeling like it? I don't feel like I'm Angel Falcon. I don't feel like it. I am. You may not feel like a child of God, but I am because... I've confessed him as my Lord. I'm, I'm in hot pursuit of him. You follow what I'm saying? Amen. You are the redeemed of the Lord. And the beauty about that is because you are blood bought, you've been purchased by the saving grace of our Lord. Amen. Then the curses of the enemy has to pass over your life. I'm not saying, don't confuse me. I'm not saying you're not going to go through anything. Sometimes you got to learn to stand. But stand on the promise. Because I know this will pass over. I might have to fight on my knees. I might have to keep standing. There may be a period, I don't know how long, and I don't care how long. However long it takes, I know, amen, that that storm will pass over me. Amen. That's why he can say, cast your cares upon me, because I care for you. See, that's a redemptive privilege. That's why he says, don't, don't, don't allow the trials of life to get you to a place of worry. Matter of fact, to him, to God. And his word teaches us that if you worry about your life, you're really telling God you don't trust him. You don't think he can take care of you. That's what you're saying to him. So when you find yourself where you want to worry, you go to God. I said, Lord, I know you got this. Grant me wisdom, strength, and courage to do what I, to learn what I need to learn, do what I need to do. And to allow you to do what you got to do. That is who he is. You are no longer. You don't no longer belong. The devil no longer has a hold on you. If you're in Christ Jesus. Everything. In other words, you, you know, sometimes we don't really realize. Look at my son, my kids, all, all of my kids, right? They all belong to me. There's nothing I won't do for them. They can be a knucklehead, they can do, you know, but I'm going to be there for them, right? Mm -hmm. There might be seasons and journeys and wilderness experience, but I'm going to be there. When they come to their mind, to their right mind. And sometimes I know, I know, I know. You look and you don't see them coming to your right mind. <laughs> That's hard to believe, Lord. <laughs> but yes. Turn to someone who says, there's hope. There's hope. To those that believe. <laughs> Just bow your heads for a moment. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you as we seek to embrace the value of our redemption. 
Thank you, Lord, for helping us see that you are our Passover lamb. Forgive us for allowing ourselves to be fretful, stressed, overly concerned about the storms of life. But I thank you, Lord, because I know that as I fully embrace what you accomplish on our behalf, that nothing, nothing that I will ever go through could ever, <laughs> could ever take root knowing that you are, that, that you are high and lifted up and that you stand assuring us that you are faithful and just who have promised. Lord, no matter what reports we may hear as a redeemed person, as a redeemed people, we will believe the report of the Lord. We thank you because Jesus is our Passover lamb. And I thank you, Lord, that every time we take partake of communion, we reestablish our commitment assured that you are faithful, 